Hello, this is uh, first in a series of podcasts um, r related to the Curriculum Development Guide for FASD training from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Uh, my name is David Wargowski. I am a physician uh, in the uh, Division of Medical Genetics in the Department of Pediatrics at the University of Wisconsin School of Medicine and Public Health. Uh, we've been working for several years on uh, clinical aspects of fetal alcohol spectrum disorders. Uh, evaluating uh, individuals suspected of having these conditions um, and trying to learn more about the spectrum and how to train uh, other individuals, professionals in various fields uh, to identify and intervene uh, in the uh, care of uh, individuals with these disorders. The first podcast is regarding the first competency which is foundations of fetal alcohol syndrome, basically an overview of some of the basic concepts related to fetal alcohol spectrum disorders. We have to begin by talking about alcohol and pregnancy in general. What we can say as a general statement is that drinking alcohol during pregnancy can cause a range of birth defects and developmental disabilities. And the umbrella term that we use for all of those is fetal alcohol spectrum disorders, or FASDs. That is not a diagnosis, but more of a conceptual term. Fetal alcohol syndrome is a specific diagnosis that falls within the FASD spectrum. One of the questions that comes up frequently is how common are these disorders? The best information that we have suggests that fetal alcohol syndrome itself has a prevalence of roughly 0.2 to 1.5 cases in every 1,000 live births. FAS, however, is a sort of a tip of the iceberg phenomenon, and the best evidence we have suggests that the full range of FASDs occur in about 9 to 10 per 1,000 live births. This, of course, puts it at about a 1% level and brings it to the level of other issues that are regarded as public health concerns. Looking at statistical information, we can begin by looking at drinking behavior in general. National data suggests that just over half of non-pregnant women of childbearing age, that is between the ages of 18 and 44, report alcohol use at some level. Just over 10% of non-pregnant women in that age group report frequent or binge drinking or other types of risky drinking behavior. Binge drinking, according to these criteria, is defined for women as four drinks or more on an occasion. Regarding drinking during pregnancy, the national data suggests that roughly 10% of women of childbearing age who are pregnant report alcohol use uh, during their pregnancy. 2 to 4% of pregnant women report frequent or binge drinking during pregnancy. One of the steps that's necessary to address FASDs is, of course, prevention. And prevention relies on delivering up-to-date and accurate information. But it starts with the basics, and so informing women of childbearing age that many women who drink during those years become pregnant unintentionally. Secondly, that alcohol is a teratogen, which in its simplest way is defined as a substance that has the capacity to cause birth defects and therefore can harm the embryo or fetus during its development during the pregnancy. Third, effects of alcohol exposure can vary widely from person to person or even from pregnancy to pregnancy in the same mother and can include physical problems, learning difficulties, and behavioral problems as well as growth impairment. And all of these can range from mild to severe. In fact, to establish a diagnosis of fetal alcohol syndrome, we look at these three criteria, growth impairment, a specific set of facial characteristics and central nervous system impairments and these can either be structural as might be seen on an MRI scan or functional problems which are more common and more problematic for most individuals and families. Whenever possible we generally try to correct for the background of the individual whether that's family background or racial background and there is some controversy about this in the genetics community but generally we try to account for background whenever possible. In regard to growth, data suggests that for each ounce of alcohol consumed per day, birth weight is reduced by roughly 160 grams. Generally, weight gain remains impaired throughout childhood, but it may improve. Often, it increases more dramatically during adolescence and adulthood, particularly for women, in whom obesity is quite common. Linear growth impairment is reflected in short stature, 
typically at birth, and this also usually persists, although again there have been demonstrations of individuals who have regained linear growth rates and attained normal stature later in childhood. Similarly, microcephaly is typically present at birth, and we would expect this to persist or even worsen over time, but there have been reports of individuals whose cranial growth improves and normalizes over time. This is important because microcephaly is both a growth phenomenon and also a central nervous system effect of alcohol exposure. And if microcephaly is identified at any point in time in a child's growth, this is an important part of the diagnostic evaluation. But it also suggests that even if a uh, child's head size is normal at a point in time, it doesn't necessarily follow that their head size was always normal if they've had a significant exposure. At some point, we had to make a decision, a collective decision, about how to characterize growth retardation. The 10th percentile for height and or weight was chosen somewhat arbitrarily, but by consensus as the cutoff level for identifying growth retardation. Uh, it's important also to note that the consensus is that this can be noted at any time throughout the child's life. In regard to the facial features, the typical nearly consistent features in children with fetal alcohol syndrome include short palpebral fissures. The palpebral fissure is the horizontal measurement of the opening of the eyelids. The second is a hypoplastic philtrum, which is the groove between the nose and mouth and hypoplastic means that this groove is smoothed, and a thin upper lip. This picture shows a cartoon depiction of those facial characteristics and a few others. Also shows that the cranium is small compared to the face and shows the smooth elongated filtrum and uh, small eye openings as well as the thin upper lip. Regarding the central nervous system problems, Common problems among individuals with fetal alcohol spectrum disorders include developmental delay, hyperactivity, learning disabilities, and behavior problems. Again, these can range widely from mild to severe and can have different levels of impact on different affected individuals. As a general rule, however, behavior problems are among the most demanding on individuals and families. Returning to prevention, the core message that we try to deliver consistently is that there is no safe kind, known safe amount, or safe time to drink alcohol during pregnancy. Again, effects of alcohol exposure during pregnancy vary widely. We estimate, based on gathering data from numerous sources, that between 30 and 40 percent of individuals who have significant prenatal alcohol exposure will have some effects of fetal alcohol spectrum disorders. That means that there is a significant proportion of individuals who have no demonstrable effects of such exposures. The specific manifestations of the exposure vary in part because of differences in timing of the exposure, amount of alcohol consumed, and other fetal and maternal factors which are not nearly as well understood. Again, some catch-up in fetal growth and development is possible if drinking stops at any time during the pregnancy. The other message that is important at the outset is that there are interventions that have been shown to be effective for people with fetal alcohol spectrum disorders. Individuals can benefit from an array of services, including early intervention, nurturing and structured home environments and school environments, education and information for parents and care providers, and involvement of caregivers in planning services and delivery. Additional information about FASDs is available through the Great Lakes FASD Regional Training Center with contact information that's presented on this slide. Or if you're outside the Great Lakes region, other regional training centers are located at various sites around the nation and can be accessed at this website. Thank you.